Hello, everybody. My name is Jane Van Hoen. I'm the executive director at the Milken Institute. And we are absolutely delighted to in, have in the audience some very distinguished guests. Um, we've got an extraordinarily packed session um, for extraordinary um, speakers. So I would ask everybody to keep to time. And hopefully, we'll have some questions at the end. Um, Wake up Europe, stories that, fa that um, frame the future. So the first up on stage is Jeremy Collar, who is the chairman and chief executive officer of Collar Capital, and a financier and an activist. Jeremy. Thank you very much. Um, do I have a clicker? So um, I get Mike asked me to give a bit of a personal story. But, yeah, whoops. Uh, my personal story is that I died five years ago. And I have seen I have a picture of it. But does, it, does the slide thing work? OK, no slides. So I died five years ago. Oh, I do have a slide. There you go, I died five years ago. And I was trying out this grave that uh, I'd bought and, uh, and then gave back. But anyway, I, um, and uh, what I mean by that is that a friend of mine asked if he could write my obituary. And I didn't really know what he was talking about. And, he, 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 and then I agreed for him to do it as long as it was uh, just private for me. And so he wrote it, and I gave him four ingredients. I want to live happy to 100. And I gave him purpose, love, health, and gratitude as my ingredients of uh, happy to 100. And he said to me um, uh, uh, that he, he wanted to do it. And we went skiing. And um, you know, he said that, actually, um, you die tomorrow, which isn't great when you're skiing. But he put down that um, my obituary was that I, um, I had built a great business. Uh, I'm chief investment officer of Collar Capital. It's, it's growing dramatically. And it's pioneer and leader. And that I'm a total bore. And he said, um, but I have another one. And that other, that other uh, obituary is gets me close to happy to 100. It got me to 98. He said, you die at 98, and you're amazing. So uh, no, no, no problems there. And he said, uh, he said that I change, that, that my business becomes great, that I um, change pension policy in Africa, and that I have a business school named after me. And, and so that journey started straight away by seeing myself as a 98-year-old on my deathbed and um, saying to myself, actually, you know, African pensions aren't authentic for myself. I have a passion for pensions, how they can create a vibrant society, a vibrant economy, etc. But I didn't have a personal passion to, for it. And I thought to myself, if I could um, save a few animals from a concentration camp, I'd be personally, authentically happy with myself. I had um, become a vegetarian at 12. I didn't believe in the way some animals were brought up, but I didn't know which ones. And so I went the whole way and thought I would decide when I was older. But, but um, uh, I, I was a passive vegetarian, you know, a bystander, as it were. And so I cha we changed my obituary to read, by 98, uh, I have a business school, my company's great, and I end animal factory farming. He wrote down it. I said, can't I just make a difference? He said, well, you've got to end poverty now. There's nothing in between. So he wrote that down, and I was laughing. How does any individual make any difference at all to anything? Um, and, and then, and then you know, and I was laughing, like a lot of people would have laughed at Abraham Lincoln when he was trying to end slavery or women's rights. But today, there is, and he paid with his life for that, but today there is no institutional investor in slave companies. 
You know, there's widespread support for equality for women and climate change, and we're at the start of factory farming. It's not about vegetarianism. This is about factory farming. And th this is Schopenhauer's three stages of truth. And, and so I looked at the issue about factory farming, and, and just so that you know, it's a new phenomenon, and you'd be forgiven if you, for thinking that it snuck up on you. 30% of pigs in the US in 1992 were kept in a factory farm. By 1990, 2017, it was over 97%. Global chicken population in 1993 was 13 billion, 23 billion this year at any one time. And 50% of fish consumed today is, is farmed. So, you know, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's cheaper for consumers but it impacts everything you care about. It's bad for humans, it's bad for the planet, and it's bad for investors. And so um, we came up with the four inconvenient truths of factory farming. The first one is, is in terms of health. I don't know if people know, but it's the number one user of antibiotics worldwide. 75% of all antibiotics in the US are used on factory farms. You see avian flu epidemics, swine flu epidemics, diabetes, heart disease, you know, obesity, and cancer as a result of factory farm. And all these things are hidden in plain sight, but they come up a lot in the press. And um, in truth number two about factory farming is it's more greenhouse gases than the whole transport sector. It's something like 35% of um, methane and 53% of nitrous oxide. And we have to address factory farming if we're to stay within the two degrees limit. We just have to. Um, you know, this picture here is, is, is an aerial view of Coronado um, feedlots. These are actually cows in the feedlots. And I, I don't know if anyone remembers what a cow pat looks like, but this is a manure lagoon. And it's huge. It's much bigger than shown on the picture. It's, it's, they call it nicely a min manure lagoon. It's the piss and shit and toxic waste from all these animals. In fact, 130 times more animal waste in the US than there is human waste. Third inconvenient truth is that animals are now outcompeting humans for cereals, demand for cereals. So it takes six kilos of plant protein to get one kilo of animal protein and four kilos of wild fish. But but where is this food security issue coming from? And where did factory farms come from? Well, just so that you all know that factory farms started in the 50s as a result of a lot of uh, foundations doing good and coming up with chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, which increased the crop yield for cereals dramatically. So dramatically, there was an abundance and farmers started going bust. And, uh, then they thought, what can we do with this abundance of cereals? Well, if, we've, if we um, can feed these cereals to animals, we can put them into cages and feedlots because we've also uh, discovered antibiotics. Although we were warned not to over US antibiotics, and that AMR is uh, issues in the news everywhere now, um, with, the, with the antibiotics, we're able to put them into cages and feedlots. And you can see here, Arable land since the 60s has increased by 8%. The population of the world has increased by 60%. Feed cereals for humans has increased by 60%. Cereals for animals, over 230%. Um, factory farming can't feed the world, but actually cereals on their own could. And then the fourth inconvenient truth is... Um, it takes 1,000 litres of water to get 100 calories from a cow as opposed to 38 litres of water from 100 calories for potatoes. It's the number one user of fresh water worldwide. If you care about conservation, it's the number one reason for deforestation, livestock production. Soya, 85% of soya um, is, is used for animal feed today. So these four inconvenient truths together are kind of four horsemen of the apocalypse or weapons of mass destruction. You know, factory, what I've put on the slide here is that factory farming is the biggest single threat to sustainability. 
this is not about vegetarianism. So for me, you know, what, what can anyone make a difference in? Well, you've got to work with the cards that you're dealt in life. I'm a chief investment officer. Um, and, and so I, I looked at, have we priced risk? And you can see here, well, I've just taken, because of timing, one company, KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, Yum Foods, underperformed the Morgan Stanley Index over the last five years, beginning in 2013 with the first avian flu epidemic in China that hit them. And constant epidemics everywhere is hitting their share price. So, you know, there are investment risks. And uh, so two years ago, um, 23 months ago, December 2015, started an initiative called FAIR, Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return. It's about materiality, not morality. So, you know, the reason why uh, investors have started caring is because they're realizing that what's the point of having a pension in 50 years' time if the temperature is 120 degrees? Or when you're looking at building a textile factory in Bangladesh, you want to make sure there are fire exits and uh, foundations because it's good business. You know, not talking the talk of human rights, etc. And so we created this collaborative network by investors for investors with the objective of closing the knowledge gap. Will factory farming become a stranded asset? And uh, We've got four trillion, in, in the space of 23 months, we've got four trillion of chief investment officers interested in this area to bridge the knowledge gap. And um, here are some of the results. So we started in December 2015 with the launch of an environmental, social, and governance booklet looking at the uh, 28 investment risk and returns issues, published that. And you can see here Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal. You know, it was just a, a, a quite a powerful start in the financial press. But then we started engaging. And in April 2016, um, engaged on antibiotics. What are the 10 large, 10 large restaurant chains doing about antibiotics in the food supply chain? They had to reply. You know, Fortune, big investors push McDonald's, Yum, Domino's to drop antibiotics or Financial Times, asset managers campaign to limit the use of antibiotics. Sustainable protein, you know, because we can't feed the world forever with animal protein, what are Unilever and Kroger and others doing about diversification? All but one have responded out of the 20 companies and we're engaged with, with uh, sorry, uh, 15 out of 16 have have responded and we're engaging with all of them. And you can see it, investors worth tri trillions urge food companies to shift from meat to plants. Very powerful uh, influence because investors, the pension plans, your money owns the businesses. And uh, created in the last 23 months a whole load of collateral um, from benchmarks to case studies. Who knew that Allianz has a case study on or had, has done work on animal welfare. So collecting these case studies is good for everyone to, to share. And, um, and then also another act of resistance, as it were, is to invest in the future of uh, food. You don't need a better factory farm. That's not necessarily the answer. You know, why not, why brew milk in a cow's udder when you can brew it in a brewery, the actual milk? And why, why kill a cow when you can grow the meat in a Petri dish? And so, uh, you know, these are just some of the companies that are, are the solutions. Perfect Day is a milk company. And um, in the last few minutes, just wanted to talk to you about what you can do as wh whoever you are. And this is about if the wealthy and powerful are not on the cutting edge, who will be? A meaning by that, you know, th it's okay for you in the West, you um, developing countries could say, but but this these are huge sustainability issues. It's a bit like why follow the West when you can go straight to digital telephony? Why not go straight to some of the solutions? Eat over consumption of meat leads to obesity, <coughs> cancer, and. Uh, AMR resistance, etc. So as an individual, eat less and better meat. 
become an individual member of FAIR, do a conditional donations policy if you're giving to charity. I gave a, a little bit of money to the Royal Academy of Arts. My mentor's the chairman. He said to me, um, he said to me, uh, that when talking to the charity fundraiser, when I was giving the money, I said, we can't, I said, no factory farm food in your restaurant. They said, we can't do that. And so we wrote to the trustees, and the trustees, quote unquote, unanimous, why would we serve this shit? And uh, so if you go to the Royal Academy, <laughs> you now get what you would get at home, or organic or, or free range, etc. As a CEO, you know, your internal catering policy, if your events manager or your internal uh, lunches, why not just tell your events manager no factory farm food? And as an investor, you can make impact investments. And um, uh, very importantly, because people have ESG research pr providers if you're an investor and are asking about palm oil or fossil fuels, et cetera, or governance issues, ask them about uh, to report on factory farms. And if you're an investor, we'd love for you to join um, uh, our investor group. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you very much. I'll give it to the next time. Okay. On a personal level, just very quickly, um, what's the main driver? Is it sustainability? Is it health for you personally? For me personally, I became a vegetarian at 12. I had an anarchic personal upbringing. And um, I am now very proud of that 12-year-old for becoming a vegetarian. And he's proud of me for um, following on with his idea. Excellent. Thank you. We'll have more questions at the end. Um, now it gives me great pleasure to invite to the stage Sylvia Earle. Um, she's the founder of Mission Blue and um, National Geographic Explorer in Residence. Sylvia. So wake up, Europe, wake up, world. We are not accounting for the real cost of our prosperity. We're not putting on the balance sheet the cost of what we take that we think of as free. That would be what we call the environment. So an American statesman, Tim Wirth, once remarked that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. After all, where does wealth come from? All creatures on the planet use the world around them. Earthworms do, birds do, we certainly do. But we alone have the power to alter the nature of nature. We look up at the sky at night, I do, I hope you do. Lots of unfriendly options out there Looking as we do is the only creatures on Earth who really know what stars are, know something about who we are, where we've come from, and where we might be going. I mean, there are other intelligent creatures on Earth for sure, but they cannot know what we know, and especially what we know now early in the 21st century. We're armed with the capacity to understand what no humans have been able to understand before. It wasn't very long ago that humans got in big trouble by suggesting that Earth was not the center of the universe. Are there still people who act as if not just Earth is the center of the universe, but that we are the center of the universe? Carl Sagan, astrophysicist, remarked once that if you want to make an apple pie, or anything else, but let's start with apple pie, you have to invent the universe. We don't have to invent the universe. It's here. We're a part of it. But it's only right about now that we're beginning to understand something about the nature of the world and how it came to be. 
what we're doing to our only home in the universe of all those unfriendly options, especially on our watch in recent decades, since the middle of the 20th century, drawing down the assets as our prosperity seems to be growing as never before with seven billion people aiming for who knows how many out there in the future, but at what cost? It's impressive to listen to the economic deliberations about human society, the problems that come with it, poverty, about all of the issues that do focus our attention as human beings, but where are we really thinking about taking care of the systems that we regard as free? The air, the water, the fabric of life itself. It's only about now that we're beginning to see as the decline of our life support system is staring at us, that we have to realize there is no free lunch. And we have to put the cost of, of our existence on the balance sheet. It's, it's not a mystery, it's a reality, but we've been holding, sort of looking elsewhere. And one of the places we've been looking is our sister planet Mars. Some say, oh, if we so degrade Earth, we, we can escape to another place. Hundreds of billions of dollars are being invested toward that dream, that goal. Even by the end of the century, some would like to see a large number of humans exported to Mars to set up housekeeping there. Well, good luck with that. Consider, yes, there are rocks and there's a little bit of water there. there might be some microbes. There certainly is a lot of carbon dioxide. The atmosphere is largely CO2 on Mars. No ocean there. Now we know what we could not know until right about now, that the ocean drives climate. The ocean drives weather. The ocean is where most of the water is, and all life as we know it, at least, requires water. 97% of Earth's water is there. It's where most of life on Earth is, too. So with every drop of water we drink, we should thank the ocean. With every breath we take, we need to thank the ocean. Where does air come from? Where does the oxygen in our atmosphere come from? Largely from those little green things that live in the ocean. Green things on the land too, photosynthesis. It wasn't uh, on the early Earth. Photosynthesis did not exist right away, but now it does. It's taken a few hundred million years of fine tuning to create out of the rocks, the water, the microbes, and all the rest of life on Earth to get a planet that is suitable for the likes of us. But here it is. In a few thousand years, humans have taken this amazing place just right for us and life as we know it and degraded much of that which keeps us alive. But the cool thing is, the best thing is, we're armed with knowledge. Every generation learns and passes knowledge along. It started ages ago, and it continues right up to the present time. So we're the beneficiaries of all that learning from thousands of years ago to decades ago to just weeks ago. We keep learning. When are we going to learn that we have to account for nature when we think about how do we, how do we make a, a prosperous, sustainable existence for ourselves? Well, first we need to appreciate the microbes. Again, every breath you take, thank you microbes, thank you ocean, it's where the action truly is. Not just for us, those little guys in the ocean not only capture carbon, generate oxygen, they capture sunlight, carbon dioxide, synthesize food, and power the great ocean food webs. It's wonderful to be in the midst of one of the great ocean food webs, and part of the trick there is to not become a part of it while you're watching it. But this is just an example of how the chemistry of the planet is shaped. Every animal, because animals don't photosynthesize, they eat their neighbors one way or the other, mostly plants, but they also yield nutrients back, shaping the chemistry of the planet. But we too are shaping the chemistry of the planet by 
tapping into fossil fuels that are not only changing the atmosphere, changing the climate, acidifying the ocean, but we're changing those fossil fuel derived materials into plastics that have served us really well in the last few decades, but too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And the single use plastics in particular, we now know, are clogging the ocean, our life support system. Just knowing that the ocean is our life support system, the cornerstone of what makes Earth different from Mars, the living ocean, is a giant step toward really becoming acquainted with the basics of what will keep us alive, our prosperity, our health, our security, life itself, all anchored in knowing and caring about where our existence comes from. In the decades that I've been around, I've been privileged to spend a lot of time splashing around in the ocean around the world, thousands of hours as a diver, many hours as well, using new technologies that didn't exist when I was a kid. They exist in our time, enabling people, and I'm one of them, to be able to live underwater. I've done it 10 times, literally, to be able to spend weeks getting acquainted with creatures in the sea, up close and personal. Harnessing technologies such as those that enabled us to walk on the moon. Not all of us, a few of us, not I. I wish I had been there. But I have been down deep in the ocean, walking around, doing things in the same way that astronauts walk on the moon, but seeing things that no astronaut could because there's no life, as far as we know, on the moon. Our planet is blessed with a lot of it. Getting there remotely, just as going up in the sky, going down with human-occupied vehicles, just as we have spacecraft that take humans up in space. It's all happening on our watch. I've been, the, been privileged to be a, a part of the action, starting three companies to actually build submersibles. I've had a chance to use more than 30 variations on the theme of little submarines, some of them so simple to drive that even a scientist can do it. I'm, I'm living proof. Blue Planet 2, the great new BBC production will feature in one of their upcoming episodes about the deep sea, a submarine that I helped build. I'm not an engineer, I'm a scientist, but working with engineers, came up with this two-person system 30 years ago, 30 years ago, that will appear with a Blue Planet series soon to take you vicariously into the depths of the Gulf of Mexico, Antarctica, and beyond. But I dream of harnessing the technologies we have to democratize access to the sea so that any of you could get into a little submarine the way you get into a car or an airplane, a boat. Think of all the people who travel in so many ways on the surface or up in the sky and how few have really gained access to the depths of the ocean. I mean, if you haven't tried scuba, well, you should at least try that. My mother waited until she was 81. It's there for you if you want to do it. She would say, if you're 81, don't wait any longer. But getting to the deepest part of the ocean, it's only seven miles, 11 kilometers, and only three people in all of our history have been there. Well, and come back. <laughs> only round trips are counted. But again, we need the technology that will take us there, not just as a now and then 20 minute excursion, or in the case of James Cameron, was able to go for two and a half hours to explore the depths of the ocean parts of the ocean that have been accessed only twice in history with three people occupy an area that is as large as the United States or Australia or, or, or China that so little has been explored. Actually, only about 10% of the ocean has been explored or mapped with the same degree of accuracy that we have for the moon or Mars. We invest in exploitation hundreds of billions of dollars invested in the technologies that it takes to extract oil and gas and now minerals in the deep sea. It's a little frightening when you think about our capacity to alter the nature of this planet for short-term gain but long-term loss. What are we thinking? What are we really thinking? When we look at the world today, it was only in the 1980s that humans began stepping out into the ocean, claiming the, the 
access beyond the land, to have jurisdiction, the exclusive economic zones. It was a big move when you think about it, one of the big land grabs on the planet. That my country, the United States, is more than twice as big as it was before the exclusive economic zones were recognized around the world. The UK has one of the largest exclusive economic zones on the planet owing to the overseas territories. Australia, again, twice as big as it once was <laughs> according to the maps of old times. Some island nations have increased their, their territorial area by more than 100 times. And then there is the high seas. That's half of the world, the global commons, like the air. Who owns the ocean? 64% of the ocean is in the high seas. So, humans, we are really good at killing things. Oh, we're good at killing one another, that's for sure. But our capacity to consume the natural world, whether it's trees, or birds, or whales, and now, starting in the middle of the 20th century, our ability, armed with technology, to extract wildlife from the ocean is unprecedented. We're talking hundreds of millions of tons in recent decades of wildlife without respect for the kind of respect we now give to birds, to mammals to some extent at least. We're just looking at those items, those creatures who live in the sea as items, as, <laughs> as products, as something to eat. We think of sea life as seafood primarily. But we have to think again or we're going to miss out on the major issue of our time, which is our ability to alter the nature of life on Earth on an industrial scale. The capture and marketing and consumption of ocean wildlife has reached a, a level that is unprecedented in all of our history. Largely, the big fish are gone. Ninety percent of the large fish, whether we're talking groupers, tunas, swordfish, cod, or many of the small fish as well, are at historic low numbers. We lose coral reefs, and we've lost about half since I began exploring the ocean in the 1950s. About half the coral reefs gone, and with them, all of the creatures that once did live there. Sharks have been particularly hard hit because of a new appetite for shark fin soup. Even the largest fish in the sea, whale sharks, are vulnerable to our appetite for taking their fins, turning it into soup or a luxury meal. It is not driven by need, it's driven by choice, largely luxury choices. With whales, we had a capacity to kill every last whale, and we came close to doing so. But here's the thing, we have a choice, and we chose in the 1980s, around the world, to stop killing whales. A few nations still engage in the killing of whales for products, for food, oil. But here in London, at the Natural History Museum, you can see reason for hope. They actually call this whale skeleton, a blue whale, hope. Why? Because she does serve as a symbol of human choice. We could have killed the last blue whale. We chose not to. They're coming back. We could, have chose, we could have killed the last of all of the great whales. We chose not to. It was our choice. We did not stop in time to save dodos. They're all gone, along with tens of thousands of other species that either because we were not watching or because we did and didn't care, they're gone and cannot be recovered. We have become the biggest predators on the planet, not crocodiles, not sharks. Look in the mirror. We are the ones. Reasons for hope. It's not just that great blue whale at the Natural History Museum here in London. Lots of reasons for being optimistic about where we're going. We have policies globally that are beginning to put nature on the balance sheet. We're beginning to recognize the importance of climate change and what drives it. The ocean, life in the ocean, blue carbon, as well as forests. I was witness to when George W. Bush took action, reason for hope, in the latter part of his administration, when he signed into action protection for a big chunk of the ocean, Pacific Ocean, 
Papahanamakuakea, we're in reserve. Reason for hope, where even fish are safe. And last year, President Obama quadrupled the size of that area in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So it isn't just leaders, although leaders respond to the people, if they're real leaders. And in Mexico last week, the president of Mexico took similar action by designating a huge area around the Riagajedo Islands along the Mexican coast for full protection, where even the sharks are safe. And a year ago, nations together, looking at the global commons, took action to establish what is now the largest protected area on the planet in the global commons around Antarctica. And just last week, nations around the Arctic, this is a really hot spot for climate change, but writing an insurance policy by agreeing not to kill the fish, at least for the time being, till we know more, but a moratorium respecting the natural condition of the high Arctic, the center of the top of the world that nobody owns, but we all really have to worry about what the future will be, depending on our actions. So plenty of reasons for hope, but only if we use the knowledge that we have to put nature on the balance sheet, to account for the costs of our prosperity. Never before has there been a better time to be a human being if you want to make a difference for the world, you know? Like, wake up, Europe. Wake up, world. This is the time to look at what keeps us alive. It's not just our prosperity. It's not just our health. It's not just our security. It's our existence that's on the line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sylvia, thank you. Yes, please. What an extraordinarily um, insightful look into uh, our extraordinary planet. Thank you so much. And there will hopefully be time for questions. But I need to keep things moving because I think we're, only, we're, we're running very tight on time. And we still have two more um, people to come up to the stage. So I would like to uh, welcome Lord Hastings, uh, Baron Hastings of Scarisbrook. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and uh, I'm sure that you've spent the better part of today struggling with a difficult dialogue. It's always when you come to anything about business and economy, it's about growth. And when it's about growth, it's about how do we project ourselves better as industrialists or financiers, how do we make sure that we increase economic value, and how do we improve the returns that we want. But I want to give you a very different dialogue to think about. Every one of us has at the center of our being something that we're longing for, which is, which is the defining legacy we want to create. And our continent needs a defining legacy. We've lost that central purpose of what was Europe really for. It once used to be about culture. It used to be about the arts. It used to be about great thinking. It used to be about writing, about a sense in which we made the world understand that it had prospects beyond us. Now what's it about? Difficult boundaries and borders, places that are uncomfortable, separating from one another, leaving and distancing, arguing over resources, never quite clear whether or not we have any real identity anymore. But we need, in my view, a very, very different narrative in our world. And here's the option to absorb a narrative that the United Nations, the companies of the world, the NGOs of the world have agreed upon, these 17 sustainable development goals. For the first time, we actually have a set of objectives which are not just about the poor world, but about the rich world too. It's an uncomfortable reality that if you go to what's meant to be the most powerful nation on Earth, the United States, questionable, you'll find that somewhere between 13 to 16 percent of its population live below the poverty line. And that may be the reason that lies behind the elections of last year. People feel disconnected and fraught, and just here in the United Kingdom, one day ago, figures revealing one in five children struggle with the basic mediums of income and therefore worry about whether there's a breakfast or not or a dinner or not. And we can all look at welfare systems and say the taxpayer provides. But even in the wealthy world, basic needs are a struggle for some. And if they're a battle for us, 
they're an enormous battle for those beyond us. The latest figures from the UN, which actually came out just yesterday morning, show that there are still around about 850 million people in our world battling to know whether or not there is a meal to be had today or tomorrow or the next day. So roughly one in seven, and that's just the 850 is the countable numbers, but one in seven of our people on our planet don't know what tomorrow holds. No idea whether they will earn or eat or do anything that looks in any way like prosperity. So we need a different agenda. Now, I'm an optimist. I'm sure all of us wouldn't be here at the Milken Institute if we weren't optimists. So here is an agenda of 17 things we can do by 2030. And when you look at it, you probably are inclined to think, for goodness sakes, no poverty, zero hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, clean water, sanitation. You're boiling the ocean. We've just been advised not to do that. But I don't believe this is about boiling the ocean or about being idealistic. I believe this is about being pragmatic. Because here are the hard facts. If we take this agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals seriously, we create an economy that will boom by an estimated 12 trillion more per year of new business opportunities. There's roughly the region of 380 to 400 million new jobs that will be created as a result of fulfilling the Sustainable Development Goals. We will unleash resources around the world. We will end desperation and ignorance and fear and hurt and wound and war. Remember this? The 1% and the 99%? Now, I know where all of us sit in this room. Some were tucked into the 1%. Because actually, as we all know, the real global figure, not the UK figure, not the US figure, the global figure for being in the 1% is roughly around $35,000. So we all probably sit, more or less, somewhere just within the 1%. And there's a whole ton of people who are outside on the 99%. And we think, but maybe it's their problem because they don't work as hard as we do, or they haven't got the same ambitions, or they don't think the same way, or they haven't been to university, or they're not well educated, or they don't pursue the options that are in front of them. And some of them, of course, get displaced as a consequence of war. Syria is a dramatic example. What's happened across North Africa is a perfect illustration. But not all of them are displaced just because of war, large numbers move because they're hungry. And when they're hungry, and they're angry, and they're frustrated, and they have phones, and they look at their smartphones, and they see how we live. And so they head here. And when they head here, they get, of course, to the boats that we've all witnessed crossing the Mediterranean. People think it all stopped. It didn't. It happens every single day. 3,000 dead in the course of this one year, drowned in the Mediterranean, 30,000 have got across passage, slavery active in Libya, people being slaughtered day in, day out, simply because they want to have a reasonable life that we take for granted. And the average child caught up as a result of displacement and migration spends 17 years in a refugee camp, an entire education wasted. And then we somehow suspect that if they come out of a refugee status, that they're going to be the civilized norm that will make our world a better place, when in fact, actually, the reality is of their own struggles, they can't cope. Now, I said at the beginning I'm an optimist, and I don't believe in preaching things that you don't choose to do yourself. And I work for KPMG, and we decided that we're not an NGO, we're not the UN, but we have a responsibility. We audit people's accounts, we provide them good tax advice, and we help them build their business. But how about going to one of the most difficult communities in the world, a tiny little village community of 10,000 people on an island, on Pemba Island, Mishawena village in the northeast of that island, just north of Zanzibar, off the coast of Tanzania, guided there by recognizably the world's most erudite economist, Jeffrey Sachs, who said, I cannot find anybody to take this community seriously. So I went there for the first time in around about eight to nine years ago, witnessed for myself what I thought was the most extreme destitution I've witnessed in any corner of the planet. And I've traveled to every corner of the planet, but I've not been down in the deep oceans. That's coming soon. But what I have seen in every corner of the world is what poverty really, really, really looks like. Having grown up in it, having seen it in the Caribbean, 
having witnessed it across Africa and Asia, I know what it looks like and what it smells like. This was the worst. No sanitation for 10,000 people. That's a bad smell. So what does an audit tax and business services organization do? Well, there were two options. You press delete when you get the information. That's what most people do. Or third op second option is you write a check to World Vision and you hope they deal with it. Or you wind up UNICEF and hope they deal with it. But most people don't engage because we're convinced that these things are beyond us. We can't actually tackle the problems of extreme poverty and hunger in our world, the destitution in our world, the lack of electrification in our world, the absence of clean water in our world. We can't actually tackle it. And we said, we will. Every year for the last eight years, I've visited this community. These are just some of the headline results of the work we completed last July. Proud to have published the report, pushed it around the NGOs, around the development community, around the UN, not to say, look at us, how well we did, but to say, if we who only produce paper and ideas can do this, there is no excuse for anyone else. The opportunity to embrace these vital sustainable development goals rests on all of our backs. But not just that, we began a campaign here in the UK to get a living wage. When everybody said minimum wages were just about survivable, KPMG said, no, we will pay a living wage. Paying a living wage to the security men and women, paying a living wage to the people who cook for us in our buildings, paying a living wage to those who clean, paying a living wage to make sure any supplier earns a decent, recognizably valuable level of income. And then turning it from one set of payments of living wage into a campaign. And guess what? It's now policy. And it's spreading around the world because when you make a commitment that costs you, and yes, it did, it cost us. It cost, but it cost to give people dignity. It cost to give people freedom. It cost to recognize their value. Australia, tucked in one little corner of it, you can see, but that's not the point. The real point is how to work with Australia as a great nation on reconciliation. We're used to thinking about reconciliation when it comes to South Africa or Northern Ireland or what happened in Rwanda or the genocide or the ongoing fights in Burma, but what about reconciling with the most destitutely abandoned people, the Aborigines? What about looking after that maybe estimated 650,000 people helping them to come forward with economic opportunity, giving them the ability to learn well, to professionalize, not just treating them as a handout culture. And it took business to decide that we would do that. And when KPMG decided we would do that with the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, then all the other businesses piled in. And before we knew where we were, 30 companies were doing it together. And what we were doing, letting our people go for six weeks at a time, paid for by the business, so they could go out spend time listening to Aboriginal leaders and teaching and transferring skills and turning communities into places of opportunity and helping to build business and making sure, therefore, they could become politically engaged but also businessly possible. Well, the story is abundant, it's true, it's fascinating, and it's real. But there's a great unresolved problem, the problem of illiteracy in our world. Most of us think that with digitalization, everybody can read. Surely, you look at a phone, you have to be able to clock on to the detail, the words, the letters. No, actually, 758 million people around the world can't read and write. Go to a prison and see for yourself the men and sometimes the women who can't read at all, at any age, and children who struggle to get through from one option to the next. So we decided what we had to do is take something of these 10 stunning statistics and begin to work on a worldwide campaign to boost literacy in every corner of the world. That meant high professionals from the chairman of KPMG, all of our professionals out there, 200,000 people, helping them to understand what it means to teach children and adults, to teach the displaced and the homeless how to read. And why teach them to read? Because in reading comes the liberty to think and to engage and to learn. And from that comes the opportunity to think about preventative health. And from that comes the potential to live the normative life most of us take for granted. And when we achieve all of that, this girl says, thank you. 
because you've had the optimism to be convinced by the sustainable development goals to do something and to deliver, to have a purpose that matters in practice, not to have a set of theories just about the opportunity of constant growth and the power of investment. So, with 14 seconds left to go, I thank you for your time. <laughs> It's sort of a little bit, I think we needed a lot more time for this session. I feel like we're just sort of passing on the baton at the moment. So um, hopefully you'll be able to get a bit of time after um, either through questions or maybe spending a little bit of time with, with the, the gentleman and, and, um, and, and Sylvia afterwards. Um, let me move on to Jay. Um, Jay Shetty, he is a storyteller and a filmmaker and a, a bit of a YouTube uh, celeb. So um, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very grateful that you've stuck around for the last session of this panel. Thank you so much. I genuinely appreciate it. I'm actually going to ask you all to stand up, if that's possible. The reason I'm doing this is you've probably been sitting down for a long time during this whole session, whole day, etc. I spent three years living as a monk in India, so we're going to start with a re-energizing activity. So what I'd love for you to do is breathe in and raise your arms. Don't hurt anyone, please. Definitely not monk-like. Breathe out and take him to the top. Breathe in and raise them back down again. Anyone feeling energized yet? No, you're not meant to. Uh, close them in. Cross your fingers. And place your left thumb over your right thumb, your right thumb over your left thumb, or keep them straight just like this. So place your left thumb over your right thumb, your right thumb over your left thumb, or keep them straight just like this. Make a choice out of the three. Lots of indecisive leaders in the room, not surprising. Uh, choose one of them. So left over right, right over left, or straight like this. Awesome. So I studied behavioral science at business school and behavioral psychology. I've been fascinated. No, no, keep them there. I've, I've been uh, fascinated by why people do what they do for a very, very long time. And in some parts of behavioral psychology, it's su suggested, how many of you have your left thumb over your right thumb? It's suggested that you're extremely intelligent, right? You can look around, make sure, verify it with someone who knows you well. <laughs> and how many of you have your right thumb over your left thumb? In some parts of behavioral science, it means that you're extremely attractive. Right? You can check that and verify that probably a lot closer with the person next to you if you know them well. And how many of you have them straight just like this? Raise your hands. Well, that means that you're unfortunately neither. Right? <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause. Take a seat. The reason why I did that, not just to break the ice, but also because so much of our life is divided in this sense. We have left and right. We have black and white. We have things that we love to do and then things that we have to do. We have things that we're looking forward to. We have things that we can't wait to get rid of. We have something called family. We have something called friends. We have some things that we hate, some things that we like. And we have something called work and something called life. And the divide and disconnect between these two often creates a lot of friction, challenge, and obstacles in our life. And I'd like to address some of that. Around 10 years ago, I was in India. I visit India regularly. How many of you have been to India? So I visit India regularly. 10 years ago, I was there. And I take retreats every year to experience how life is as a monk. So I take groups of people away who get to live like monks for weeks and experience sustainability, the philanthropy projects we've created, a food project that distributes 1.2 million meals per day. And when we do that, I have a list of top 10 things that you should know about before you go to India if you've never been there before. And if you've been there, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So the number one thing on my list is remember that something will always, and I mean always, break down. Right? And if you've been to India, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I can see the people laughing in the audience who definitely know. So 10 years ago, I got back from an evening out to my friend's apartment building, and he lived in a 30-floor apartment building. Guess what was broken? <laughs> the lift, the elevator. So we were young, athletic men, or so we thought. He conveniently lived on the 27th floor. But we thought we would run up. We thought we'd be there in no time. We got to the first floor. We got to the second floor. We got to the third floor. We got to the fifth floor. And by that time, we were already out of breath. And we said to ourselves, why not tell each other stories, jokes, and entertain each other as we walk up, because it will make the journey easier and quicker. We said to ourselves, it doesn't matter where you are, it matters who you're with. Anyone ever said that to themselves before? Whenever we go through challenges, everyone gets philosophical. And we were getting very philosophical that day. But we got to the 10th floor, telling jokes and stories, got to the 15th floor, got to the 20th floor, and we finally reached 
the 23rd floor. We were four floors away from our destination. We then noticed that one of our friends hadn't yet told a joke. And now we all have that one friend who's not very funny, right? Everyone has that one friend. If you're not laughing, that friend is you. <laughs> Someone's thinking about it right now. They have an image of you in their head. So this was that one friend in our group who's not very funny. And we said to him, look, it's your turn. It's your turn to tell a joke. Go for it. He said, no, 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 I, I don't know what to say. And we were like, look, just say something. It's absolutely fine. He said, no, 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 I'm not funny. We said, we know you're not funny, but we're four floors away. You could say anything and it won't matter. He said, you know what? I left the keys to the room downstairs. <laughs> and he wasn't joking. Now, I believe in nonviolence, but I've never wanted to hurt someone more in my life. Why am I telling you that story? It's because today, when I coach millions of millennials online and Gen Zs online, when I coach celebrities, influencers, executives, when I share with them this story, they've all said to me that it acts as such a metaphor for a point in their life that they wish they came to sooner. And that was a point in their life where they'd increased their bank balances, they've achieved so many awards, accolades, they had success reaching incredible ambitions that they always had. But they found at one point in their life, which they wish they came to sooner, was when they realized they felt they left the keys to real fulfillment, happiness, and meaning somewhere downstairs. And they wish they came there sooner. It reminds me of a great anecdote which is often attributed to John Lennon about a group of students at the age of six who were asked, what would they like to be when they grow up? Does anyone here remember what they wanted to be when they were growing up? You can shout it out to me. Anyone bold enough to say, what did you want to be when you grow up? Because it, pilot, thank you very much. Anyone else? Oceanographer. Oceanographer, wonderful. Are you one of those today? No. Okay. Anyone else? No, I didn't mean, to, just checking. Anyone else? Anyone else want to share what they wanted to be? Explorer. So all of these kids wrote down different things. Some wrote down scientists, some wrote down astronaut, some wrote down doctor, some wrote down engineer. And when the teacher was marking through the paper, she saw that one of the kids wrote down the word happy. She went up to him and said, John, I think you've misunderstood the assignment. He said, Miss, I think you've misunderstood life. <laughs> a very bold, confident young man. Especially very bold and confident because in some parts, some studies and research shows that the UK currently is the second best education system in Europe, just behind Finland, which has been at the very top for quite a long time. Extremely amazing systems. Some actually tout the UK to be the number two education system in the world, just behind Canada. But the UK is being number two. The emphasis on that number I want to focus on today is something very different. And that's this fact. British millennials have the second worst mental well-being in the world, to the point that suicide is at record levels amongst students at UK universities. This is real. It's true. It's happening right now. It's growing. 450 million people on the planet are at least reported to struggle with mental health. They say one in four people that we meet is struggling with a mental health condition, whatever it may be, whether it's stress, anxiety, depression, as far as suicide. And these numbers are only on the rise. And this isn't a UK issue. It's not a Europe issue. The highlight is because we're in London today. We're in the UK. But it doesn't take much to go on Google, and you can try this out yourself. This is a screenshot. University makes me. And you can see the emotions that people are searching. This isn't my search, by the way. This is the actual search. If you just type in the words, university makes me, this is what you'll see. It's an extremely, extremely serious issue. And it's incredible because I come to this point about how we've trained people for jobs, or tried to, but not trained them for life. And I believe that this is one of the biggest challenges and wake-up calls that we need, because how can these people go on to lead our societies, businesses, philanthropy projects, all of this great work that we want to do in the world when there's so much turmoil, disharmony, and disunity within us. The incredible thing is that it doesn't stop there. Millennials are more depressed at work than any other generation. Gen Z closely behind, making it into that space. And mental health problems are forcing thousands in the UK out of work. Again, not just limited to the UK. In Japan, they actually have a term called karoshi, which means workplace death, because 10,000 people actually drop dead at their desks every single year because of overwork and the lack of meaningful work. 
To me, this has been my fascination. Personal engagement, personal meaning, purpose, fulfillment has been my work since I started studying at the age of 16 was when my fascination began. And the reason is because I really feel that if 75% of the workforce is going to be millennials by 2020, full of millennials and Gen Z by 2025, if these are the challenges they're facing now only on the rise, how will we solve the world's biggest problems if we can't help our own people and start with them? So there is a solution. There are ideas. But I started to look deeper into actually how people got into the workplace, what jobs they were taking on. I work with several organizations on their recruitment policies and how they select the right talent for the talent's well-being and the talent's success and the company's success. And I found the most common resume lies. And this kind of piqued my interest. I wanted to share them with you. 57% of people lie about their skill set on their resume or CV. How many of you have ever lied? You're all lying, obviously. 57% of you should have had your hands up. Uh, embellished responsibilities. 55% of people lie about their responsibilities. 42% lie about dates of employment. You work somewhere for three days, you wrote three months. Somehow managed to be the same. Job title, 34%. Senior managing director just sneaks in there somehow. Academic degree, 33% lie about their academic degree. Howard and Harvard seem to have a lot of correlation in their resumes. Companies worked for, 26% of people lie about the companies they worked for. 18% lie about accolades and awards. But I went a step further. This was 2,000 HR recruiters interviewed about their most memorable lies. These were the most memorable ones. Applicant claimed to be the assistant to the prime minister of a foreign country that doesn't have a prime minister. <laughs> right? This is real. This is true. Applicant claimed to have an Olympic medal. Applicant claimed to have 25 years of experience at age 32. <laughs> Smart, right? <laughs> Applicant applied to a position with the company who had just terminated him. He listed the company under previous employment and indicated on his resume that he had quit. And finally, applicant claimed applied twice for the same position and provided different work history on each application. Extremely creative. I spoke to these people. I reached out to them. I went out and I spoke to them. I sat down with them and I asked them, why did you lie? And you had the answers that you expect. We lied because we need to get that job. We need the money. We need to convince the people that we have the experience. I didn't have the best experience in childhood and education growing up, so I have to make do with it somehow. And then I penetrated further and I found that an incredible amount of them actually shared that they lacked self-awareness. They lacked a deep understanding of what they actually had. They really didn't understand their skills. They didn't really understand what they brought to the table. This wasn't a lack of self-confidence. A lack of self-confidence is when we don't believe in what we have. This was a lack of self-awareness where we don't know what we have. It's a very different situation. They had never been asked. What do you love to do? What are you good at doing? What matters to you? What values do you bring into the workplace? They were always trying to match. Then I read this beautiful quote by Thomas Cooley, where he said, today, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. And I'll just let that blow your mind for a moment. He said, today, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. In other words, we're living in a perception of a perception of ourselves. The values that we take on are based on the values we believe other people want us to have. And this was in the 1900s. Instagram's made it a lot worse. So these are the challenges really facing all of our future leaders. And we created a method based on ancient wisdom, modern science, and accessible entertainment as to how we can completely revolutionize that. And it's called the virtual school of unlearning. Inspired by Albert Einstein's statement, education is what remains after one has forgotten what one has learned at school. It's when we forget the habits, we unlearn the mindsets, the habits, the principles, the ideas that don't serve us anymore and replace them with ones that will for the future. It says that the illiterate of the 21st century won't just be the people who can't read and write but those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. The ability to completely unearth, refine, reawaken the potential that's within every single human and allow them to bring it out through education rather than put into someone in their education. 
And this school has two main parts. We call them the compass and the community. Every human being in life requires their personal compass that can't be defined by anyone else but them. It can be inspired and influenced, but can't be defined by anyone else but them. And they need a community that allows that compass to thrive. Isolation is the new big epidemic. Isolation is the new big challenge. That is the cause behind a lot of these mental health challenges we're seeing. The compass and the community. This is the compass, inspired by the Dharma Vedic model that I learned when I lived as a monk, and the Ikigai model, the Japanese for reason for being. The intersection between what you love, what you're good at, what the world needs, and what you're paid for. That intersection is where humans feel fulfillment, meaning, passion, purpose. It's pretty simple, but taught nowhere in the world. The compass is this. A real education needs a heart, a head, and a hand. Character, competence, and compassion. In our world, we've focused heavily on the head, not so much on the heart or the hand. The heart being that which helps us with resilience, dealing with pressure, focus, the ability to make tough decisions, integrity, which we're seeing is completely being obliterated out of every area of our lives today, and the hand, which we've heard so beautifully about today, the ability to help. And therefore, the virtual school of unlearning, which has been tested in groups with people in school systems, with organizations, will be an online school, the first school of its kind, where you don't come to learn about science, maths, the future, innovation, but the first school where you come to learn just about yourself. Because I truly believe that business school taught me how to make a living, but living as a monk taught me how to make a life. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I'm afraid we have run out of time. We're rolling straight into the plenary session. But if there's anybody here that would like to spend a little time with uh, our distinguished guests um, and ask some questions, please uh, feel free to do so. Um, alternatively, the, uh, the plenary session is going to be starting very shortly. Thank you. <laughs>